Well, thank you for that exceptionally kind introduction. Uh, I really appreciate that. And um, I'd like to say what a pleasure and also a very distinct honor it is to be standing here um, in front of you today, this afternoon, at such a, a special event, 150 years of BASF. And to tell you a little bit about we, where we're going in energy storage, so that'll mean I'll have to tell you a little about where we've been so that um, I can sort of show you uh, where the future is. So let me start with just um, reminding you a few points from Stephen Chu's very elegant presentation this morning uh, that highlighted the fact that we have, currently we're using about 17 terawatts per year of energy. We're gonna be getting to 28 terawatts by 2020. That energy has to come from somewhere. Right now it's mostly petroleum. And, um, and that really, uh, the solar energy component of that uh, is less than 1%, 0.25 to be specific, and yet there is much solar energy available. So this leads to all of the above, including, of course, climate change. And in Canada, we're particularly worried about this because of <clears throat> what you see here, the diminution of the sea ice. And um, though that may seem like a good thing, global warming, in fact, it's causing uh, tremendous um, cold fronts to come down from the Arctic, and um, we see the sea ice melting at dramatic rate, and that rate is not just linear, but it's now increasingly um, going down. And that causes problems not just for the poor polar bears in the Arctic, but for snow in Boston. And if uh, Boston hasn't had enough problems already, um, uh, flooding is now per is predicted to be occurring as a result of these um, water rising levels, which will be occurring in the next few years. So. Electrochemical energy storage, I think, is more important at this time in the future than ever before. It's certainly going to be used to drive portable devices for you know, the Internet of Things and things of that sort. But specifically, it's needed to couple renewable energy um, to a source which is stable, thus preventing or overcoming the, in the intermittent nature of that energy storage and of, of the um, rather renewable energy. And that can come in the form of wind power or, of course, um, solar power. And so in this little cartoon, we envision the power from wind and solar to be coupled to either large-scale grid batteries or even mini-grid batteries um, that can be stationed in one's home, perhaps run off solar panels. These are connected through transmission lines and, of course, ultimately enable um, electric mobility. So the point of this slide, this has already been mentioned a bit today, is that off-peak capture is essential to stabilize the renewable energy. And the other point is that there is not one battery that fits all. So for grid storage, one needs very inexpensive type systems, and that could include sodium ion redox flow batteries and sodium lithium sulfur combinations, and uh, these various combinations for electric mobility. So I'll be just touching on a few of these um, today. But the take home message I think is pretty obvious from this um, symposium. You can't develop long range electric vehicles without advanced batteries, and you can't sustain renewable energy uh, without storage. So I'll be telling you just a, a little bit about where we have come from, and that is mostly intercalation chemistry, storing ions and electrons in framework structures. And I'll be telling you a bit more about where we're going, um, chemical transformation cells involving lithium sulfur, and I'll just touch on lithium air uh, before finally concluding. So intercalation, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, um, means to interpolate in a days in a calendar, or more specifically in the context that I'll be discussing it, uh, to insert something in a, in a crystal lattice. And it's um, a term that is uh, widely used in the battery field. And so when we talk about capacity, we can talk about electrons stored per mass or per volume. And so that leads one to the conclusion that one wants lightweight, dense materials. The capacity times the voltage at which those electrons are stored gives uh, what we call the energy density. And again, that can be expressed in terms of per gram or per liter. So during the talk, I'll be using both capacity and energy density interchangeably, uh, depending on what I'm discussing. So this little cartoon shows the discharge of a cell along with the, elect the electrons move through the external circuit, lithium ions move into the layered oxide, and this is a system on charge. So if we just let this run again, we have the discharge of the cell, the ion movement accompanied by the electron movement, which is then um, pumped, well those, those electrons are pumped uphill on the charge cycle. So this was um, developed sort of mid 80s, early 90s, 
and it can be summarized by this equation shown here. This is the equation on charge. And the positive electrode itself has a capacity, which we express in milliamp hours per gram, but you can call that coulombs. And it stores, whoops, it stores those electrons at uh, 3.9 volts. So when we multiply those two together, that ends up with an energy density of about 700 watt hours um, per kilogram for the positive electrode alone. But when you put this in a full cell, these uh, numbers get diminished because of all of the battery components, the cell components. And so this gives rise to approximately 110 watt hours per kilogram at a pack level for today's batteries in a normal um, electric vehicle, depending on the vehicle, vehicle, of course, in question. So this chemistry of the layered oxides um, was finally recognized just last year when the uh, four scientists who developed this won the, Dra the Draper Prize uh, for their work. And there's a few important messages here. One is that um, John Goodenough, who I regularly, widely consider to be the leader here, uh, developed most of this technology starting in 1984. So this is 30 years on, he was finally recognized uh, for his work. And so what that means is that uh, he's 93 now. So obviously one needs um, good longevity genes in order to uh, witness the fruits of your labor. And, um, and he's still going strong. Um, the other is that uh, this is Rashiji Jami and Yoshino and Nishi. This is um, best done in teams because batteries, as I hope to explain to you, are fairly complex. And they require not just understanding electrodes, which is one of John's contributions, but also the electrolytes, which are the contributions of the other scientists, and the negative electrode um, here. And it requires interfacing all of these components uh, together. And that, as I said, can be quite complex. So the subject of my talk is not to tell you all about lithium-ion batteries, but more where we're going. And one of the places we're going is what I call below lithium, because sodium is below lithium in the periodic table. This was a popular um, battery technology in the 1980s before mobile technology took over. Sodium is heavier than lithium, of course, and it also has a 0.3 uh, volt penalty versus lithium. So it reduces the amount of energy that one gets from the cell. And it also has the problem of a greater volume change on cycling, which can cause um, a problems because one is pushing grain boundaries around. But nonetheless, it's becoming, uh, it's undergoing a bit of a renaissance these days. Um, you can read about it in our recent review article. And this is basically driven not so much by the fact that lithium is in short supply, but for especially for large-scale devices such as grid storage, um, there are clearly advantages of having a, an a, a, a abundant element. So we started in this in 2007, and things were still quite quiet then in sodium ion technology. We developed this material, which was, is very similar to a very famous material that John Goodenough developed, which is lithium iron phosphate. So we sought to find the sodium analog. And in terms of a framework, it exists, but the exact same material is completely inactive. So we ended up finding a new material, which is the one shown here on the left. And when one charges this material, one removes one sodium per formula unit, the other, sodiums, other sodium stays behind to actually prevent these large volume changes. And so this is a material that has about half the volume strain of the so-called famous lithium iron phosphate. And it has been um, investigated by many folks since then. Uh, Langrock et al. published a nice paper in 2013 showing that it's a relatively stable system. And there's also been some very nice work now done in layered oxides. Again, this was work that was well done back in the 80s, especially by Claude Delmas and, and others. And it has undergone a renaissance. And I just highlight some work um, carried out by Komaba's group in Japan on forming a layered oxide from using iron and manganese as the elements in the layered structure. So this has layers, just like this material has layers, but in this case, they're connected by phosphate groups, whereas here we have sheets of metal oxides and the sodium ions uh, reside between those layers. And the advantage of this structure is the phosphates bestow upon the material much greater oxidative stability. On the other hand, one can get slightly higher capacity, somewhat higher capacity, um, out of the layered oxide systems. This, unfortunately, um, comes along with a, bit of a rather large amount of capacity fading. So you can see this is over 30 cycles, where this is over 100 cycles. So um, there's a lot of work being done on trying to ameliorate these problems in the layered oxides. Uh, there's hopefully a lot of promise in that area. But one of the things we're really concerned about is how sodium moves around in lattices. 
And um, Garrett Cedar has done a lot of calculations in the layered oxides. We've done calculations in the phosphates. So I'll just briefly mention some of them here. This is the uh, material that I, I mentioned, lithium iron phosphate. And it has an activation energy to lithium ion hopping of about 0.6 electron volts. And it has one dimensional transport, as you can see. And this is the material that I just spoke about, the sodium iron phosphate. And it has two dimensional transport because of course it has two dimensional layers. And you can see very comfortingly that the activation energy for energy hopping is about half that in the case of the lithium material. Now this is somewhat material specific, so um, we were sort of fortunate in this case, but it's turned out over many materials that we've looked at over the last few years, this is um, a fairly common theme. And Garrett Cedar has seen the same doing calculations with the layered oxides. So one way you could understand that is that in lithium ion materials, the ion, because it is smaller, uh, still bearing a positive charge, tends to bury itself in deeper thermodynamic wells, whereas those wells are shallower for the sodium ion as it moves through the lattice, and therefore it can actually attain diffusion coefficients that are similar to the lithium cobalt oxide that John Goodenough developed uh, back in 1985 or 1990. So that is, um, that is certainly very promising. Uh, the problem is getting the energy, getting the voltage up, and also, of course, the capacity. So we have developed, through much scheming, um, a new material which has the following formula. And in this formula, two of the sodium are actually mobile, which we've proved by uh, various processes. And the nickel can be oxidized from two to four. So it's a two electron couple, as opposed to simply a one electron couple, which was uh, the case in the other material that I showed you. And uh, best of all, it has very low activation energy for mobility, very equivalent, equivalent to the material that I just described. And this has been borne out by, uh, by both computation and experiments in which those values um, nicely match. So the tunnels of the pathway for the sodium ion migration that has the lowest energy are shown here by these curved pathways in green. And consideration of that material's um, uh, that, uh, mass, and most specifically volume or density, along with the number of sodiums that can be extracted, lead us to predict a voltage of about 5 volts with a very good and high uh, volumetric capacity of 2160 uh, watt-hours per liter. Now, of course, again, that's going to be diminished should we ever be able to make a full cell of this material. So, well, did we make a full cell? <laughs> So the problem is, uh, now we've got a great high voltage material, the problem is now finding an electrolyte that's stable at that potential. And also finding a suitable electrode, a negative electrode material. And this is where I bring up this concept of people working together in teams to try to overcome uh, the problems in concert, uh, which is really very important. So not, not to change topics here, but just to point out <clears throat> that Toyota, um, uh, wrote a part of an article, this is actually written by uh, another person, but this was presented in the MRS Bulletin in December 2014, and it simply says that a Toyota roadmap suggests that all solid-state batteries are an important step in the evolution of energy and storage technology, but perhaps are not the ultimate solution, so they consider lithium air batteries to be the ultimate solution, whereas the all-solid-state battery um, is transitioning between here and here as the years um, go along. So our cell with even 600 watt hours per liter would be uh, right in the center, very nicely in the center. But solid state batteries are, are quite um, difficult to actually build because it requires um, knowledge of not just chemistry, but this, this complex interface. So this is just a, a cartoon that shows how we might build one of these. Um, at the negative end, we would have some material that would accept sodium. This is things like hard carbons or other oxides. The positive electrode material made of our sodium nickel uh, fluorophosphate. And the point is that the solid electrolyte, which can carries the sodium ions that are necessary to balance the flow of electrons, is present both within the space between the two electrodes and also fills the space within the electrodes itself. So effectively, you have the two electrodes immersed in this solid matrix of an ion conductor. And that's where the challenge comes, is in actually making these interfaces uh, with the solid state materials. And I'll come back to solid state batteries um, a little bit later. So um, a common complaint, of course, is um, with ones at a dinner party, uh, you know, why haven't you guys built better batteries by now? And so um, Stephen Chu pointed out this morning that in fact things have got quite a bit better. Um, it's not true that nothing has changed. It's also true, of course, that there's no Moore's law. We're not um, following this because this is physics and we're dealing with chemistry. 
quite a bit different. Um, but this is a little roadmap prepared by Peter Bruce and Jean-Marie Tarascon of where batteries have been in the past, where a lithium-ion battery will typically take you today, at least in a Nissan LEAF, and where we'd like to go in the future. So, of course, I should remind you that even though internal combustion engines still seem to be the predominant um, technology in most of our cars, they're only about 25% efficient, whereas an electric motor is 90% efficient. So we're never going to beat gasoline in terms of energy density, but that doesn't mean that it's not extraordinarily viable technology. I think I'm probably speaking uh, to the choir here, preaching to the choir. So um, if we can achieve these values, we can um, get to higher energy density. That means a elect better electric vehicle range at a lower cost. And cost is incredibly important in this, in this business. And of course, that will reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and uh, lead to less CO2 emissions. So then the question is, how do we climb this curve? How do we get up to these, um, to these lofty levels? So I'll tell you a little bit about the sulfur and the oxygen cell. They're actually fairly similar in many ways. Uh, the oxygen cell, the aprotic cell is somewhat different from what Yang Shaohorn was describing just earlier in the afternoon. So I'm going to be talking about lithium air cells at the very end, but those in which we do not cleave the oxygen-oxygen bond. So in peroxide, that bond stays firm, and therefore this technology does not need to catalyst. And that is a tremendous advantage in many ways, and, but it has other, many other challenges. But I'll start off talking about the sulfur cell, uh, which is a four electron couple compared to that of the lithium air cell, but it is a lower voltage. So that means ultimately that the um, theoretical capacity is about 2,500 watt hours per kilogram, but practically we'd only be really trying to see about 600 watt hours per kilogram in comparison to the higher values uh, for the oxygen cell. So sulfur is, uh, the, I mentioned cost, sulfur is an extremely cheap element. Um, it turns out that Canada is the world's largest exporter of sulfur by consequence of the fact that it is a byproduct of the oil sands refining process. So it's sort of ironic that that which messes up our environment so much with CO2 would also produce a byproduct that might help to mitigate the CO2 emissions. But that's um, uh, sort of a side point, I suppose. So it's $170 a ton, uh, as I said, making it very inexpensive. And in sulfur batteries, um, it undergoes a complicated process, which I will call cheese to milk to cheese, because I think that explains how difficult that technology actually is. So we start off with a solid, which is sulfur, and that solid is transformed by reduction, in other words, by adding electrons, to a material, which are, these are called lithium polysulfides, and they're extremely soluble, so we'll refer to that as the milk. And that gets transformed again to another solid, back to the cheese. And this has to be done reversibly. And as I said, it has a capacity of about 1675 milliamp hours per gram. Storage at two volts gives those numbers that I was talking about earlier. So it's a fairly simple process, but it is the dissolution of those polysulfides that causes all of the problem. So I'll just walk you, walk you through the cell. Initially, the lithium is oxidized at the negative electrode. Electrons flow through the circuit, and they reduce the sulfur to a series, a cascade of polysulfides. And we don't really know the exact numbers here, where so we have a pretty good idea, especially from doing complicated spectroscopy, but these sulfides are in actually in equilibrium with one another as we move them further and further down the reduction scheme. Then, as we get to the point of maximal polysulfide contri um, con uh, contribution or concentration in the cell, which occurs at a very well-known voltage, these materials becoming having been solvated highly, start to cross over to the negative electrode. And what they see is a face of metallic lithium. So they end up being reduced. And if this happens enough times, you build up a thick layer of these products. And the problem is that both this Li2, the, the product, and the reactant are both insulators, and they're really good insulators. So this effectively can sort of shut down the cell if this layer gets thick enough. On the other hand, this is where we want this reaction to take place, in other words, in the positive electrode. So we want to form our Li2S in this side. The other problem of having polysulfide dissolution is that the sulfur that deposits on the negative electrode, if it is actually removed by oxidation, if the layer is thin enough, will end up transporting within the cells, right, animation got a little off there, uh, back to the uh, positive electrode. And that causes what we call an internal redox shuttle, 
and that is a source of uh, poor efficiency, poor columbic efficiency in the cell. And it's also effectively what we call an internal short circuit. So for those two reasons, uh, death of the cell and loss of um, columbic efficiency, we have to find ways of constraining the polysulfide to the positive electrode. So when we first started this in 2006, we used a fairly um, simple idea of taking carbon fibers, and these have um, little holes going down the center, they're not really carbon nanotubes, and they're spaced apart by little carbon fibers, thus forming channels that are about four to five nanometers in width in which we can incorporate molten sulfur. And this molten sulfur melts at 150, so this is pretty convenient. And once you cool the system down, you end up with space within this aggregate in which you can bring in the electrolyte, hence your lithium ions, and carry out your battery reaction. Now, these assembly, uh, the assemblies of these carbon rods are actually large. They're microns and microns large. So a lot of this process relied on physical trapping of the sulfides within this matrix of the carbon fibers. And we also added polymers, hydrophilic polymers, to aid the process. And, um, you know, it actually worked pretty well. We were able to get 1,000 milliamp hour gram capacity fairly reliably. And even better, now that when we form the product, which is this lithium sulfide, the end product of the reaction, it is also now in contact with the conductive carbon. So we've managed to maintain contact not just of the insulating sulfur, which is the product, but also the insulating Li2S, which is, sorry, the, Li, the sulfur, which is the reactant, and the Li2S, which is the product. So both are shuttling back and forth in a, in a very um, intimately mixed nanoscale network. So um, over the last few years, the activity in this area has grown um, quite extensively. So we're, this was just last week, too. <laughs> we're, we're looking at about 500 papers a year. It might be up to 550 by now. So this has really taken off. And it's almost impossible to tell you about everything that's happened during this period of time. So just a few highlights. And the bottom line here is that we've looked at various porous carbons, as described here, where we've made nanostructures, very pretty, fancy carbons, as Professor Orbach calls them. And these have pores that trap the carbon. We have uh, values. We've been able to obtain values for 1,000 milliamp hour gram capacity based on all of the metrics in the cell. And just for the cathode, come up with numbers that seem very appealing. Putting these into practice is another matter. We finally also turn to porous carbon spheres. So these are spherical, um, spherical type spheres that have a porous exterior. And when we impregnate them with sulfur, they end up with sort of a bathtub ring of sulfur uh, that impregnates not just the pores, but the inner part of, of this shell. And that allows that sulfur to expand when it's reduced uh, to fill the extra space that's within the pore. And this gave rise to um, quite stable materials. This is shown over just 100 cycles. But more importantly, this allowed us to carry out experiments on a synchrotron using X-ray absorption spectroscopy to understand what was really going on in the cell. And this is just a, a three-dimensional image of the spectra that were acquired every 15 minutes with the electrochemical profile shown here on the side. So we were able to track the electrochemistry in this cell every 15 minutes as it was running in situ and get a full understanding of what those intermediates, those polysulfides were, what their chain length was, and how they were redistributing and forming the ultimate product. So I won't bore you with all of those details here. I'll just tell you that what we learned is that carbon is a very bad material for, for binding polysulfides. So we found, under many different conditions we ran this, the shuttle mechanism and this self-discharge process were particularly um, enhanced in the form of a highly carbonaceous material, one that was almost pure carbon. So then this led us to looking at other materials, and we turned to, first of all, to oxides, we started wrapping our spheres with oxides such as silica and titania. This worked fairly well. This shows a picture of a layered um, carbon initially and after it's been wrapped with silica. And you can see it sort of looks like a baby smooth bottom here, a very smooth surface because of that oxide coating. And we also put conductive vanadium oxides in the surface and that worked reasonably well. And then finally we realized that we really needed to be looking at metallic oxides. 
And um, so just uh, last year, we developed this uh, material, which is TI-407. It's a conductive metallic oxide that goes by the name of the Agnelli phase. And we call it a two-in-one host, because not only does it offer, is it a conduit for the electrons, so now we don't need carbon, but it also binds the polysulfides uh, very well to its surface. And uh, I add that um, Yi Chui and I have been sort of running neck and neck on these sorts of materials for the last few years. But I was surprised to learn this morning that Stephen Chu has now uh, joined this team. And so I'm not sure it's a level playing field anymore, but <laughs> I'll still continue to do our best. <laughs> so the point is that the high conductivity of this um, substance delivers the electrons. The high surface area binds the polysulfides. And the most specifically, the surface properties inhibit this polysulfide diffusion in the cell. So this just shows our, um, our materials that we carefully tailored. These are nanocrystallites, 10 to 20 nanometers in size, and they're organized into these aggregates, which effectively form uh, these uh, sort of polysulfide sponges. And we call them bifunctional because they're conductive and because they, they bind the sulfide. And um, this is just a TM image showing the location of these um, crystalline materials within this matrix. So the proof of the pudding, so to speak, uh, is in this uh, data, and this was taken from the operando, in other words, in working cells in situ, that we also looked at uh, at the advanced photon source. And so the results for um, a boring carbon are shown by the dashed line, and you can see this massive influx of polysulfides, which are shown in blue, immediately when we start the cell. And these polysulfides flood the cell until we finally get down to full discharge, which is not actually the full discharge of the cell, but it's, it only gets to a partial discharge. Along with that, we see the sulfur is consumed. This is the red line, and it reaches a certain value, which is never really zero, and just sort of tails off. And more specifically, the uh, product, the Li2S, doesn't really start to precipitate into the end at which it precipitates very suddenly. And that's what we don't want. We want a slow, gradual, controlled precipitation. And that is what we see in the case of the TI-407. So the um, sulfur contribution comes down much more slowly and eventually reaches zero. The um, lithium sulfide precipitation is a much more controlled fashion, almost steady. And most specifically, we have reduced the amount of uh, polysulfides in the cell quite considerably. So that was really good news. We were really excited about this. And uh, we also have learned, and I won't go into all of the details, that it promotes, the, the metallic host actually pr promotes electron transfer at the interface because of its very highly conductive metallic nature. So just summarizing, in the case of carbon, when we reduce the sulfur to form the polysulfides, they waft off into solution. They undergo chemical equilibration that actually precipitates out the product, the Li2S, which is what we don't want because it precipitates in many areas of the cell where it becomes inaccessible. In the case of the TI-407, we have an interface-mediated reaction, whereas we form the polysulfides the, at that metallic interface, they, are, um, control, they undergo a control reduction to form the product of the cell, the Li2S. And of course, then on charge, the whole process is facilitated as well by exactly the same processes. So we see um, greatly enhanced capacity retention under these conditions. So in the last year, we've looked at other uh, systems for trying to bind polysulfides, not just by a, a strong chemical absorption, but in this case, actual chemistry. And the two favored materials um, that have come up, not just to mention our own work, have been graphene and gra graphene oxide and nitrogen doped graphene. And this is work of Zhang et al. reported last year. And you can see that they're able to sustain cycling in the cell over 2,000 cycles using this nitrogen doped graphene. And Elton Cairn showed um, similar, but well, fairly similar, not quite as good, work about a year earlier um, with graphene oxide. So I'll be just talking a little bit about these so-called inorganic graphene oxides, which are layers of manganese dioxide. And because it is an oxide, and I think I've already hopefully convinced you that oxides are pretty good at, at binding sulfur, sulfides, uh, this works as well, if not equally well, mostly because this is a completely unoptimized cell, and in this case, we have 75% sulfur, whereas in this case, it's about 55%. Uh, so we have uh, much higher sulfur contents, and yet we can still cycle it at fairly high rates. So I'll tell you just a little bit about um, how that works. So the inorganic um, 
MMNO2, they're called nanosheets. They're a little thin, uh, approximately 10 nanometer uh, waft, waft, wafts, <laughs> thin um, sheets of manganese dioxide. And we melt diffuse sulfur just like we did in the previous case. And this allows us to easily incorporate, as I said, up to 75%, 75 8% sulfur. And you can see that the sulfur is not agglomerated in this scanning electron microscope image. The sulfur is, is simply bonded to the surface of that inorganic graphene. And we can map this using sulfur and manganese and see that these uh, map or they co-map on each other. So in order to really prove that this was working, we actually carried out cells um, with uh, optical access. In other words, cells that were clear. And we compared the cells using the manganese dioxide nanosheets with those with a carbon that goes by the name of Cajun Black. It's a fairly standard carbon that's used under these conditions, under exactly the same loading. And so you can see in this um, blown up image that at this point where we maximize the formation of the polysulfides, in the carbon cell, you can see them very clearly in solution. They're evident from their golden yellow color, whereas such a color is just only barely evident in the manganese dioxide cell. And at the end of reduction, at the full discharge of the cell, there is no color remaining whatsoever in the MnO2 cell, whereas the uh, carbon cell is still fairly intensely colored. So this shows the inability of the carbon to bind the polysulfides, and yet the remarkable ability of the manganese dioxide to do so. So how does this work? Well, <clears throat> this is all chemistry. That's what this BSM symposium is about, so I'll just throw a little chemistry at you here. Um, we understand this process quite well now. The initial polysulfides that are formed react with the manganese dioxide, and they reduce the manganese 4 to manganese 2, and in doing so form thiosulfate groups on the surface. And those, those thiosulfate groups do all of the action and they do so by a complicated uh, reaction, which is um, known to some German chemists as the Wackenroder reaction, whereupon this thiosulfate that is actually uh, resting or anchored on the surface of the MnO2 sheets incorporates higher polysulfides, which catenate into the sulfur-sulfur bond, and literally it spits out a lower sulfide, which ultimately is the reduction product that we're looking for, the Li2S. And I know you're possibly not leaving me here. Um, I'll just show you a little bit of data. It's the only real data I have in this talk. And it's very simple. Um, this is the spectral signature of the thiosulfate shown in purple. This is the spectral signature of the, that uh, polythionate intermediate shown in, in rust. And the interesting thing here is that when we use graphene as a substrate, we do not see the thiosulfate and the polythionate. It is only in the case of MnO2 and graphene oxide that we see these features, and they are correlated with this tremendously um, ex extends, or this tremendously enhanced uh, cycling stability in the cell. And we see those uh, same species, the thiosulfate and the polythionate, in real cells as well when we look at them in situ. So this is why graphene oxide works so well. It's also why MnO2 works so well. This is um, at least our belief. And we've also done chemical experiments to measure the absorptivity of polysulfides. So in the case of carbons, you can see it's extremely low. In some of the oxides, it's fairly substantial. But in the case of the graphene oxide and the MnO2 that bind by this thiosulfate mechanism, uh, we see values that are unapproachable by any other materials. So. Um, this work, I might add, was carried out not just uh, funded by BASF, but it was actually carried out in collaboration with BASF, uh, with uh, Thomas Weiss in particular, who was really instrumental in helping us understand some of this chemistry. So this just shows the data that we're able to sustain very stable cycling over 200 cycles in five hours, and also at a rate of um, cycling in two hours on a sweep or a, or a charge sweep. Um, maintain over 1,500, and we actually have 2,000 cycles of this cell. And just to put things in context, that represents cycling over, over two-thirds of a year. So we've, we're down to a capacity fade of 0.04% per cycle, and uh, as I said, that's over 2,000 cycles, and that's equivalent to some conventional metal oxide systems. We have 75% sulfur loading in the cell, but the challenge now is to actually build thick cells uh, and overcome some of the transport limitations when one goes into a system with a thick cathode. And we also have to overcome some difficulties at the uh, lithium negative electrode, which are uh, another large challenge. But um, we think that this is at least a step forward, not to overhype things, but it's, it's a step along the way. So 
what I've told you about is um, chemical confinement in the last few slides with um, conductive hosts. What I haven't told you about is the other direction where you use um, electrolytes, which are highly solvating, and those can be used in redox flow cells, otherwise called catholite cells, in which you let all the polysulfides dissolve. Now, they don't have very good volumetric density, but they have um, other positive characteristics. In another direction, one can use electrolytes that are completely non-solvents, meaning the polysulfides don't dissolve at all. Those are, um, can reach high capacities, but they have interface challenges because of the problem of the lack of egress, ingress of the um, electrolyte into the, into the solid mass. And then finally, there's all solid state batteries, which I alluded to in earlier, I mentioned earlier in the context of sodium ion cells. And one can imagine these, and in fact, they have been, um, they're actually being developed uh, for sulfur. And so uh, the a design what this might look like is an anode, which is typically, um, it has to be a lithium indium alloy for various reasons, a solid electrolyte, which is, has um, lithium ions now instead of sodium ions as the conductors, and sulfur um, particles that are intimately mixed in that electrolyte. So this data, or this um, concept, has actually been put into practice just very recently. Uh, by a group in Japan who have mixed a, a very complicated uh, arrangement of materials, and um, they have managed to achieve almost the theoretical capacity for this cell. Uh, it's only over 10 cycles, unfortunately, at this point. But um, it, it's, uh, it's certainly, I think, quite hopeful for such technologies, and it really, it really depends on interfacing the sulfur particles with that conductive additive in a way that controls those interfaces, which is what I was explaining um, in the previous part. So in other words, that is, that is just as important for solid state cells as it is for the more liquid cells. So um, what all solid state batteries have in common with lithium air, and you're, um, I'm gonna just finish off on that, is this control of interfaces. And so even though this is not really predicted to become technology until 2030, many of us hope we'll still be around by then, um, so I'll just end off in a few points um, that illustrate where we are going. I, 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 don't, I don't really, as I said, have time to explain all of the many problems. But this illustrates a voltage profile for a cell, either a carbon-type cell, which is shown in green, um, or a cell which has a poorly functioning electrolyte, which is shown in blue. So I think it probably is um, understandable that one would like the discharge process to take place at a similar potential to the charge process. In other words, a situation, something like this, where the charge would be on that white line as opposed to being at a very high potential. And the reason the lithium air cells have such a high potential on charge is only literally beginning to be understood in the last year or so. Um, and it is really necessary to bring this over potential down to regions something like this in order to make these cells viable, along with a lot of other problems, of course, as well. But what this high overpotential, even in the case of a carbon cell, means is poor round-trip proficiency and also poor cycling. So there is, uh, as I said, many, many multitudes of, of challenges in these cells. Um, one of them is that the electrolyte causes problems because it degrades on the surface, so we need both a robust surface and a better electrolyte. Uh, the reactivity of the electrolyte with the product, which is peroxide, is a problem as well. So we, again, we need a better electrolyte. And there are some groups around the world working on this. And the other problem is the reaction of lithium peroxide with that surface when it deposits as a thin film. And that is because carbon especially reacts with peroxide to give lithium carbonate. And that is at least 50, if not more, 50% uh, of the reason for why that overpotential is so high, because it's very difficult to get rid of that lithium carbonate. So it can form from two sources. One is from reaction with the electrolyte, and the other is, the, is reaction with a carbon surface. So just as in the case of the sulfur cell, we needed to get rid of the carbon, so to speak, or at least purely carbon materials. And we, that means we need a metallic, porous, and non um, Sur catalytic uh, surface. And when I say catalysis, I don't mean electrocatalysis, I mean that in which we bind the oxygen to transfer the electrons to it, because it's not catalysis in the same way that Yang Shohorn was explaining with electrocatalysis. So I'll just say a few words on that in my last uh, minute. We started uh, working on this in 2012 by looking at metallic oxides. Um, more recently, Peter Bruce in 2013 has reported on a metallic titanium carbide, which both of which work reasonably well. 
And um, just uh, recently, a few months ago, we found a metallic oxide, which was of course the same one we were using for the sulfur cell, conveniently. And we've learned that this TI-407 is, in this state, it is metallic, but it forms a passivating layer of a suboxide on the surface. And that is what actually controls the interface. So rather than fully oxidizing, it just oxidizes to a um, conductive, but not fully um, oxided material. And that enables us to achieve fairly low um, potentials on, on the onset of oxygen evolution at about the equilibrium potential of three volts. And um, so we're pretty excited about that. We do online spectrometry to actually show the oxygen evolution in the cell. And you can see as soon as we start to charge the cell, which is shown in the red curve, we see the immediate um, evolution of effectively quantitative amounts of oxygen. And the only problem is right here, this is the CO2 evolution. And uh, we, that is because of the electrolyte. So we need an organic chemist to um, help us make new electrolytes. So if you take this to an artist, um, the, the, the interface between art and science is very interesting. And, and this is what you get. This <laughs> looks like sort of a nuclear reactor with some lithium peroxide and some stars. I don't know what the stars are doing there. Anyway, I thought I would just end off on that note um, and remind you that battery materials chemistry is very multifaceted. It's complex. We've needed to develop in situ methods and sophisticated ones to peer inside the cells to try to find out what these problems are. I think I've also hopefully convinced you that not one energy storage fit battery fits all needs. There are many uh, under debate at the moment, along with the ones that I mentioned, also sodium, oxygen, and magnesium ion chemistries. And I guess more specifically, energy for the management for the next decade will require not just energy storage, but also conversion, which I think we're all going to hear about next, and I'm very much looking forward to that, and also energy efficiency, and of course, LED lighting, and smart grids to control the system. So I will just um, end off by thanking my co-workers, my students and postdocs who did all of the work, and my collaborators were shown here, especially BASF for their continued funding of our lithium sulfur program, which has um, been absolutely indispensable, and also uh, Jay Caesar for funding some of the lithium air work, and our other funding agency from Canada, and um, there's a little picture of a Volkswagen car, the plug-in version. Thank you for your attention. BASF. We create chemistry.